Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for being with us uh, in this um, webinar, which concerns a topic extremely important, in particular from my country, but not only because it's, I think, a very European and not only European issue. Uh, and is exactly a problem uh, which makes the politics and, 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 and uh, societies uh, wonder about the development in, in, in Europe and um, uh, about the, it has, may have very serious political consequences for the European Union, uh, for um, uh, such countries as, as, as Poland, Hungary and other Eastern European countries, but not only uh, this uh, question which must be settled now are of the absolutely pivotal relevance for for our future. So I'm very glad that uh, we can meet here um, and I have the honor to, to present excellent speakers for this, for this panel. We have a honor to have with us Silvana Schara, member of, of uh, Italian Constitutional Court, the first woman elected to this Constitutional Court. Um, we have a honor to have with us um, Ms. Kathleen Gutmann, um, and she is a referendaire uh, in the Court of Justice of the European Union. Uh, we will have, but she will join us uh, a little bit later, uh, Vice President of the European Court of Human Rights, um, um, Senja Turkovic. And we have uh, our also our rapporteur from, from, the, from the group on the independence of the judiciary and fellow of, of um, the University of Cambridge, uh, Sophie Turin. Um, we will um, we'll be focusing our panel on, uh, on the work of the, of the group, of course, of, on independence of judiciary. We are working on somehow adaptation of the of the Monscopus principles on the independence or standards on independence of judiciary to more European context. But this is exactly what um, Sophie will tell us. So, Sophie, you have a floor. Thank you very much, Frederic, for your kind introduction, and uh, many thanks to the organizers for their kind invitation. I'm delighted to be here, and I speak on behalf of all reporters to thank warmly all those involved in this project in one way or another. This project aims to promote common standards of judicial independence across the European Union in particular. We are at the early stages and we are fully aware of the work still needed on the draft uh, set of provisions that we circulated, but this draft already allows us to introduce the four main features of this project. First, we aim to give a European focus to these standards. Second, we look at judicial independence in the round, transversally. Third, there is a constant tension between the need to safeguard the independence of judges and the need to make them accountable to. And fourth, we look at judicial independence on the ground as much as in the books. So what does it all mean? Turning to my first point, we aim to develop standards based on an existing set of standards, the Mount Scopus International Standards of Judicial Independence, which were consolidated in 2018. Many international standards on judicial independence, including the Mount Scopus standards themselves, reflect common law features. And our position is that the significant differences between common law jurisdictions and continental European jurisdictions, mainly the existence of career judiciaries make it necessary to review, update, and adjust the Mount Scopus International Standards to the situations of the EU judiciaries today. And of course, we draw on also a range of existing European instruments for that purpose. It is vital to insist on minimal guarantees of judicial independence and impartiality for all judiciaries in the EU. There is no effective judicial protection and no mutual trust without independent courts. We need to be clear, however, that our aim is limited to articulating 
situation, the situations where red lines are crossed. In no way do we aim to develop a unique framework, regardless of each country's traditions and individual problems on the basis of EU law. In this respect, I would echo Advocate General Bobek, who recently suggested in his opinion delivered on 20th of May 2021, in John Case's C74819 to C75419, that, quote, not all matters possibly concerning the rules that govern the judiciary or court proceedings are an issue relating to the rule of law under Article 2 of the TEU, and therefore fall within the scope of EU law. Advocate General Bobek refers to dealing with pathological situations only, and this is the scope of this project too. We still hope that the finished product, the Eli Mount Scopus standard, may be of more universal use beyond the boundaries of the EU member states. For example, the point made in the draft circulated in Article 9 about the need for specific safeguards to protect judges against the threats of disciplinary proceedings, this provision, this point, is of a universal character. So we are likely to rephrase this provision as we think about how we can distinguish or integrate points which are specific to the European Union member states without diminishing the general relevance of the Eli Manscopus standards. It may simply be a matter of developing a commentary on EU law and a CGAU case law separately from the provision itself. Second, following some research and discussions among members of this project, we expect our standards to cover a broad range of issues in at least four areas. First, judicial recruitment, appointment and promotion. Second, governance of the judiciary, including judicial councils and the quality and the efficiency of the justice system. Third, the disciplinary regime applicable to judges. And four, standards of conduct, including judicial freedom of expression. There are various links between these areas. And it also means that judicial independence needs to be considered transversely in the round. For example, our draft standards on the disciplinary regime emphasize the need for a fair process for the accused individual judge. And we mentioned in our draft the right to notice, the right to be given sufficient disclosure, the right to be heard and make representations, the right to be given reasons. And we still need to consider the proper grounds for disciplinary liability and sanctions in light of the principles of security of tenure and proportionality. But we also know that in some career judiciaries, the evaluation or the promotion system and or the reappointment or the transfer system are likely to work in some cases as a de facto disciplinary process. The transfer of judges to other courts might act as a disciplinary sanction and so that appraisal or transfer is a matter of consideration in more than one context. Third, the need for checks and balances regarding the judiciary creates a continuous tension between judicial independence and the public accountability of judges. In a context of disciplinary liability, we see a tension between securing the independence of the disciplinary process for the individual judge and making the judiciary as a collective accountable for the disciplinary regime in force. For example, should we allow judges to self-regulate the disciplinary process or should other institutions or actors, such as the executive, play some role? And if so, under what constraints? There is great diversity between countries in identifying where the disciplinary authority might lie whether it is for presidents, a collegium of senior judges, superior courts, or a judicial council, or the minister of justice. And in some jurisdictions, the disciplinary authority might be shared by several bodies. Above all, the issue for us is to identify best practices or common standards for judicial discipline, which can attract a broad agreement, at least among EU stakeholders. Fourth, our analysis of judicial independence is not purely one of form. It is about the application of the law on the grounds as much as it is about law in the books. 
This is why we aim also for a commentary and or checklists to accompany our standards. And we aim in particular to bring together key references to the case law of the European Court of Human Rights and the Court of Justice of the European Union regarding judicial independence and impartiality. Great attention has recently been paid to the case law of the CJEU and to recent cases of the European Court of Human Rights, of course. And we know that the European Court of Human Rights has developed a very substantial set of principles and guidance over the years. So putting those two sets of case law together will give a concrete picture of the problems that our standards are meant to address. So we hope, in other words, that a greater degree of specificity on some, some topics with a commentary and or some checklist will reinforce the practical impact of these standards. And this, we suggest, will usefully supplement information which is present elsewhere, such as in the Justice Scoreboard 2021, on how justice systems are organized or can be organized to protect judicial independence in situations where independence could be at risk. For example, the Justice Global 2021 shows indicators on authorities involved in making appointments of Supreme Court judges. However, as is expressly acknowledged, there is no assessment or quantitative data on the effectiveness of the arrangements, and it is far from obvious how this information, the information listed in that scoreboard, is being used to monitor the rule of law in EU member states. Without referring to any specific country, our commentary will aim to go further than the Justice Scoreboard and other statements on judicial independence by openly considering the problems that each standard aims to address. To conclude, we do not assume that the organization of the judiciary is the source of its independence from government and private interest. Judicial independence depends much on the constitutional relations external to the judiciary, such as the relationship between parliament and government. Judicial independence is also a significant component of government culture, and judicial independence must be supported by the political climate and social consensus. However, articulating more concrete standards of judicial independence and accountability will foster an open and transparent discussion on how to reinforce the value of an independent and impartial tribunal, as well as how to prevent abuses of power. So we welcome everyone's suggestions for enhancing the quality of this project, and I look forward to hearing views and comments about it. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie, very much for this excellent presentation. I would like also to inform that we have a question and answers uh, possibility, and you have to, if you want to ask and then to, to present your views and to comment, you may do it um, on, on a question answers form. Um, so thank you for this introduction uh, to our principles. And now, um, um, Justice Schiara. You have the floor. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me on this uh, panel and thank you for the project you are so brilliantly uh, launching today. Uh, I have to say that I express my own point of view and not the one of the court I'm honored to work for. Um, uh, we are all aware of the centrality of this theme that you are approaching in your project in the EU discussion, but not only, it's a much, much broader discussion. Uh, in a sense, I can say this is an unexpected centrality of this discussion in Europe. Perhaps a few years ago, we wouldn't have expected to be discussing so much judicial independence and to link judicial independence to the respect for the rule of law. Uh, Basically, we are discussing the core principles of democracy and democratic states. So really, we are uh, discussing the centrality of our own role as academics, as lawyers, as judges. Um, there is a scholarly discussion on what is described as systemic deficiencies in some states, in some countries. Uh, I understand 
Advocate General Bobek discusses of pathological cases. Uh, so we have this in, in the background, not so much in the background because we are aware of pathological situations. Uh, and uh, of course we are aware of how several issues are encompassed in the judicial independence issues and how the very values of the European Union on which European Union is grounded are uh, under threat in some cases. Hence, I think it is a timely discussion. It's a very uh, good idea that you, ELI is launching this project. And um, I think the very notion of standard needs to be uh, clarified in a sense. Uh, it's a crucial notion because the project also uh, acknowledges legal diversities among uh, member states. And Sophie just mentioned of a transversal approach, which is interesting, you know, the diversity and yet the transversal approach. L let me point to possible synergies, which I'm sure are already uh, uh, well known to those of you who are taking part in the project. But I was uh, very interested in listening the other day to the inspiring keynote speech of the Council of Europe Secretary General in the opening session of this, uh, uh, the opening ceremony, in fact, of this year's conference. And in the 2021 uh, report on the state of democracy, human rights and the rule of law, we read about a coherent, and intense approach to this subject matter, focusing on relevant standards to be respected, both via hard and soft law measures. Uh, the Secretary General mentioned the importance of soft law measures in the Council of Europe's uh, overall organization, the SOFIA Action Plan, for example. And the report uh, focuses on relevant standards let me just mention only a few, but they were already mentioned in the opening speech. Um, councils uh, for the judiciary to be set at the constitutional level. Uh, judges appointment regulated by law uh, based on objective criteria. Sufficient funds. Now, this is a very timely discussion again, because we are expecting some European funds to be uh, uh, granted to member states and to be actually directed towards the judicial organization. So sufficient funds to carry out the essential functions of the judiciary, etc. And let me focus also on measurement criteria for, for example, institutional accountability, transparency, open hearings and public reports, responsibility on media, etc. So we, we have uh, so many concepts which are sort of floating uh, in the discussion, not, as I mentioned, not only in the European Union, in the Council of Europe and in international organizations. And another possible synergy in a different context uh, are the ELI principles on uh, COVID-19 crisis, which I read uh, very carefully because although that is a different kind of emergency, but in the preamble to that document, uh, in particular, we read, uh, and I quote, uh, it, it is in the interest of society that measures against COVID-19 are imposed and enforced within the framework of established democratic principles and the rule of law. So here we have two different kinds of emergencies very different, I'm aware of this, coming together uh, in this um, passionate defense that we all pursue of the rule of law. Uh, uh, auspices are that national parliaments act very cautiously in uh, uh, taking initiatives uh, during the emergency, the COVID-19 emergencies, and we know that the risks of emergency legislation when we go beyond the notion of emergency and we expand the notion of emergency too far. And therefore the centrality of the principle of proportionality, which is a principle assisting 
uh, so many decisions in national courts and in supranational courts. But let me get back to this idea of the legal diversity among uh, jurisdictions that are coming in uh, uh, the analysis of your project. And the emphasis that the project we are discussing should put on criteria, criteria, not so much for the purpose of the traditional comparative law approach, I think, but rather for establishing criteria of interpretation. But I may be wrong on this, but I would like to hear comments. Um, criteria of interpretation of EU law, namely the, the Treaty of the European Union, the funding values of European legal order after Lisbon. Uh, and these values are at the core of the very rich case law of the Court of Justice, which I meant I heard was mentioned uh, in the opening speech. I, I should come back to this uh, briefly in a few minutes, but just a, a comment on the role of uh, international association uh, of courts and international associations of judges that you are relying also on uh, an international association of judges for independence. Uh, because the Mount, the Mount Scopus uh, international standard originated from an international academic association. How this networking of courts and judges uh, is influencing very much the work of courts and of judges. And I'm just uh, share with you my own experience. For me, this was uh, a very uh, nice uh, surprise, how much work uh, the courts do together in uh, international networks. The, in, the Italian Constitutional Court is um, part of the European uh, Constitutional and Supreme Court networks, which is the uh, organization so much wanted by President Lennart. And uh, it's becoming uh, a, a very intense, uh, uh, I follow the Italian Constitutional Court for this as a delegate, and it's a very intense work. We discuss criteria, we discuss ways of uh, putting on the platform, which is shared by all the courts, uh, decisions which are relevant for European law, which doesn't mean that any other article of the treaty or directive is quoted, but is quoted in a relevant way in the national uh, decision. My own experience is this is a great collective uh, project and we are growing on that experience. So networking is important. And it's, uh, I think, one of the best ways to ensure cooperation. Cooperation is much more than dialogue. Cooperation among courts, sharing criteria of interpretations. Uh, this is interesting because it really brings together different national languages. We even try, and this is a very ambitious project here in Italy, to uh, improve the uh, translation into English of uh, some decisions of the Italian Constitutional Court, because we think also in the adoption of a common language in translations, we can sort of uh, uh, enhance even further the cooperation among courts, because behind, behind the language, behind expressions and words, there are concepts and there are legal concepts that we want to share uh, very much. So the ELI project should enter, I think, this, which I call as a virtuous circle of judicial cooperation, enhancing concrete ways to fulfill uh, its objective. So I hope once the project will be finalized that there will be a way of making it public, of discussing it in network, in, or maybe even in single course, maybe in seminars with um, individual national courts. And I, I welcome the idea to support draft rules with a commentary. We, we heard this is a strong point of the project, bringing together international standards as well as uh, European Union standards. 
Uh, let me point to this recent communication from the Commission, which I'm sure is well known as the uh, last July, I think, EU rule of law report, in which the Commission underlines a coherent method adopted for the 27 member states and the centrality once more of the proportionality principle. Let me also mention that discussions on the rule of law in the European Union is triggering, uh, in my own reading of these complex events, uh, an extraordinary interinstitutional confrontation. I use the word confrontation because sometimes it's, uh, it's an intense, uh, it's more than a discussion. Uh, uh, for example, this August, the European Parliament threatened to start an action against the Commission on the delicate question of the allocation of funds to member states not complying with the rule of law. Uh, the theme of conditionalities and sanctions is relevant and certainly, I think, could be included in the project, I'm not sure, because it is an indirect way to look at the enforcement of the principle of the independence and the rule of law. Certainly, if should this not be part of the project, I think it is a very new and uh, once again timely discussion that is going on in, in the European Union. Uh, I, I don't want to refer to any particular ruling of any of the Court of Justice referred to any particular country, but I can see that the draft proposal, the way I've been reading it and the way I've been reading some recent uh, rulings of the Court of Justice, resembles the language of the Luxembourg Court in many parts, not only of the Luxembourg Court. And I think this is a, a merit of the draft proposal. Um, all I want to say is that we are as lawyers experiencing a very intense time and at the same time, an inventive one in which perhaps we can propose new ideas. I'm always in favor of uh, innovating and saying something new, particularly when academics are involved in research projects of such a high standard and level. And, and therefore, reading and absorbing the jurisprudence which is behind the actual case law of the Court of Justice recent decisions, but also of the European Court of Human Rights, which writes monumental decisions on the independence. Really, uh, so complete and so sometimes even difficult to read, one needs a long time to absorb the intensity of that language. So again, we can detect the effort to take into account this interinstitutional impact of the court's decision. If we look very carefully of the way recent decisions in both courts, Strasbourg and Luxembourg have drafted, there is a lot going on behind the scenes of those decisions. And they try to describe as much as possible the role of institutions at the national level and supranational level. And I've always found fascinating from my days at the European University Institute, this analysis of the interinstitutional uh, dynamics. So uh, I think to enter almost sometimes some passages of the decisions display an almost contextual analysis. Uh, you know, we are exposed to understanding the technicalities of some systems. And, and the emphasis on the combinations of measures affect, affecting at the same time the independence um, of judges. So the timing of certain reforms, for example, the very chronological order of certain reforms, how that affects the independence of the judiciary and sometimes how they illustrate the chain of events which is behind those decisions. They come together in a very complex scenario with many varied uh, actors on the stage. I find this fascinating, sometimes boring, but nevertheless fascinating and uh, important to be looked at very closely. And the in-depth analysis of the ways uh, different bodies operate in different countries 
particularly the ones enforcing disciplinary measures, which have not been so central in academic discussions before. I may be wrong on this, but uh, now they are crucial. We look at them <laughs> with the same intensity we look at the actual work, of course. In conclusion, uh, I think uh, I say we, I should say you, but I feel part of this, uh, after this discussion, we are together climbing the Mount Scopus uh, with uh, enthusiasm and, and, and caution, because certainly it is very delicate um, ground, but we are looking forward to seeing from the top of the Scopus, of the Mount Scopus, new horizons for all of us uh, in Europe and beyond Europe if necessary, because I'm sure the project will go beyond Europe. So I, I, I really welcome the initiative of the ELI in this and I congratulate you on the GAT proposal and thank you for listening to me. Thank you, thank you, Justice Chai, indeed, for this encouraging words and, and presenting this panorama of, of, of issues, of problems, and the perspectives of networking, of cooperation, and uh, uh, developing of our project and then disseminating it. And uh, uh, we hope very much, indeed, that it will be a kind of, of, of impulse for, for European discussion. Um, and this is probably the main purpose of it. And indeed, we, we are looking on this incredible shift in, in, in topics because of his development and, and awareness on, 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 for instance, disciplinary issues, which is uh, which are so important now. Thank you so much, very much, very indeed. Uh, now we are still waiting for um, uh, for uh, President Rukovic, and uh, until this, um, we have a honor now to to to, uh, to give the floor to uh, Dr. Gutmann with her comments. So you have the floor. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, colleagues, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I am delighted to be here today virtually at the ELI annual conference of which I have been a member for many years uh, in order to provide some reflections on the progress report of this project in the light of the case law of the Court of Justice of the European Union. Before proceeding further, I should mention that this presentation is solely my personal opinion. Now, by way of introduction to the subject matter, this is surely an opportune time for engagement with judicial independence and the first segment of this project concerning disciplinary proceedings, taking account of recent developments in the case law of the Court of Justice on these matters. Thus, the aims of this project, according to the progress report, to provide common standards on core themes underlying judicial independence in the European Union is well to be commended. In that regard, the progress report indicates that there are at least three key aspects underlying this project, which make it stand out. These include, first, the consideration of the case law of the Court of Justice and the European Court of Human Rights. Second, the greater degree of specificity in respect of the standards elaborated. And third, the inclusion of a commentary, bringing together the various sources and potential solutions and approaches. These three key aspects can in fact be drawn out or ventilated further when placed against the backdrop of the case law of the Court of Justice in this area. And therefore, my comments and reflections center on these three key points. That being said, I hope that your questions will tease out further aspects, which I may not be able to touch on due to lack of time. Starting with my first point regarding the reference to an analysis of the case law of the EU supranational courts. Indeed, the case law of the Court of Justice may be considered a valuable aid for parsing out the relevant standards. This is aptly illustrated by the Court of Justice's recent judgment in case C-79119, Commission v. Poland, delivered on July 15, 2021. This was the third infringement action brought by the European Commission against Poland in respect of national measures 
establishing a disciplinary regime for judges, which was found to infringe Articles 19 and 267 of the treaties. In particular, in paragraphs 137 to 140 of that judgment, the Court of Justice made clear that the putting in issue of the disciplinary liability of a judge as a result of a judicial decision should be limited to entirely exceptional cases and be governed by objective and verifiable criteria, emphasizing that I quote, it is essential that rules should be laid down which define in a manner that is sufficiently clear and precise the forms of conduct which may trigger the disciplinary liability of judges in order to guarantee the independence inherent in their task and to avoid exposing them to the risk that their disciplinary liability may be triggered solely because of the decisions taken by them. Furthermore, as demonstrated by that same judgment, there is considerable interplay or synergies between the case law of the Court of Justice and the European Court of Human Rights, given that as the Court of Justice has recognized, the guarantees of Articles 47 and 48 of the Charter, which include the right to a court established by law, the right to have a case examined in a reasonable time, and the rights of the defense apply to disciplinary proceedings against judges, which thereby takes into account the level of protection guaranteed by Article 6 and 13 of the European Convention as interpreted by the European Court of Human Rights. Indeed, as Advocate General Tanchev concluded in his accompanying opinion in that case, the, these rights form part of the right to a fair trial protected by the second paragraph of Article 47 of the Charter, along with Article 48 when it comes to the rights of the defense. And therefore, these together with judicial independence constitute key elements of the right to effective judicial protection and the fundamental right to a fair trial in EU law. In fact, it remains to be explored further in the Court of Justice's case law, the extent to which, as Advocate General Bobek remarked in his opinion in the Romanian AFJR case, that the Charter may even provide a higher standard of protection than the European Convention in this context. Turning to my second point, with re which relates to the greater degree of specificity of the standards on judicial independence. In particular, as noted in the progress report, this entails elaborating basic or main terms and concepts. For example, the term judge as mentioned in that report for the purposes of formulating the various standards. This would appear to be of the utmost importance for the segment on disciplinary proceedings as shown by the case law of the Court of Justice. For example, this arises with regard to elaborating the very notions of disciplinary proceedings and measures. In his opinion, in the recent Commission v. Poland case just mentioned, Advocate General Tansha drew in his opinion from guidelines issued by the CCJE, that is to say the Consultative Council of European Judges, in finding that the notion of disciplinary measures denotes any measure by which adversely affects a judge's status or career. The Advocate General also referred in his opinion to other materials, such as the United Nations Special Rapporteur's recent report on disciplinary liability, which encompasses consideration of traditional sanctions, as well as what is called or what is referred to as disguised sanctions, thus highlighting issues where greater specificity in terms of these notions of disciplinary measures and sanctions would be helpful. This is further illustrated by several of the Court of Justice's recent judgments on the Polish regime, which have focused on investigations as well as the actual disciplinary proceedings brought against judges. Moreover, the court's recent AFJR case or judgment on the Romanian regime has highlighted the interplay between the personal, criminal, and disciplinary liability regimes for judges. And this might also be expected to arise in the pending case 
C-20421 Commission v. Poland, which is the fourth infringement action brought by the European Commission against Poland and relates, among other things, to the competences of the disciplinary chamber of the Polish Supreme Court uh, with regard to the criminal as well as the disciplinary liability of judges. At the same time, it should be pointed out that the Court of Justice's recent case law sheds light on depth as well as breadth issues relating to disciplinary proceedings. For example, while much of the focus is put on disciplinary liability of judges, such case law has involved disciplinary measures and proceedings brought against prosecutors and lawyers as well, as illustrated by the pending cases C-74819 and C-5520 involving the Polish regime as discussed in Advocate General Bobek's recent opinions. Finally, as regards my third point on a commentary, bringing together various sources and solutions, it should not be underestimated that the role of the commentary for ensuring the practical utility of these standards looms large in the European Union context, especially taking into account the unique sui generis role of the Advocate General in the Union's judicial system. As is well known, the Advocate General is charged under the treaties to bring to the Court's Justice's attention all possibly relevant materials in his or her opinion in order ultimately to help the Court of Justice to decide the case before it. That is why references to various standards of judicial independence that we all know that have been issued at the national, European and international levels as well as related materials are more often mentioned in the opinions of the Advocates General than the judgments of the Court of Justice. And when it comes to judicial independence, there are certainly various standards to sift through as evidenced in the opinions of the Advocates General in the recent case law. Therefore, such commentary appears to be extremely useful in view of the function of the Advocate General opinion to have everything in one place, namely the most recent and the most relevant in terms of an advanced codification and modernization of standards to draw from and helping to further develop the Court of Justice's case law on judicial independence. Therefore, to conclude, the case law of the Court of Justice may be considered to play a valuable role in the process of elaborating standards on judicial independence undertaken by this project for possible use not only across the European Union, but also in other jurisdictions around the world. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Gutmann, for this excellent, excellent speech. Uh, it is extremely important. We had yesterday this discussion on, on, on this neutral approach, what exactly the disciplinary procedure in our sense should mean, that it must be much broader and uh, we, we have to find the wording which exactly will address those very different measures which emerge in different systems and, and uh, even with the abuse of different systems, uh, which makes it even more tricky. So thank you very much for this incredibly uh, inspirational speech. Um, we have a pleasure now to, to have the, the president uh, through COVID with us. Thank you very much for, for, for uh, joining us in this extremely busy time. Um, Justice Trukovic, you have a floor now. No, we cannot hear you at this moment. So. Okay. Uh, do you hear me now? Okay, okay, okay. So I uh, apologize that I was not able to be with you, uh, you know, and I was not able to listen to the uh, presentations up to now, but we had a grain chamber and that just finished uh, five minutes ago. Uh, 
and I have to reboot my mind now from something that is completely different to something that I will be talking about. But I heard the last two sentences and I can just pick up there uh, because the approach of the, of the Luxembourg court and Strasbourg court is quite similar and the both courts, I think, rely uh, very much on each other's uh, jurisprudence and very often they pick up when uh, their one court has stopped and then they develop more and then the other court picks up and develops a little bit more and and, 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 and it, it, it goes in, in, in certain direction. Of course, uh, the, in the same way as the Luxembourg court is relying on number of international documents uh, and the European documents, uh, either EU documents or documents of Council of Europe, the, the court is doing exactly the same uh, in all areas and in this area, of course, as well. So uh, all these documents are helping us uh, to frame uh, our decisions and by framing our decisions, of course, uh, we are taking very often uh, issues a little bit further and then we are helping actually you to frame and to further develop, uh, uh, develop standards and rules. I have decided today not to go into the whole spectrum of the case law, which is abundant uh, in front of our court uh, that has been developed over the years. But since you have said that you would like me to talk about the recent developments, then I have picked up just one area that is maybe not so directly connected to the disciplinary uh, sphere, uh, disciplinary sphere for judges, but it is connected, especially after the last judgment that has been produced by section one of which I am a president and uh, where we have all the Polish cases and this is the judgment of Reskovic versus Poland that has been published in by the end of July of this year and uh, I have decided to talk um, uh, about one of the institutional um, prerequisites uh, or institutional elements of the of, the, of, the, of Article Six, when we are talking about judiciary, when we are talking about so we are talking about the independence, we are talking about the impartiality, but what is very important from the perspective of the development of our case law recently is actually the uh, requirement that the court has to be established according uh, to law or it has to be established by law. And uh, in this respect, uh, the three judgments, uh, recent judgments are very important and I will be talking about that and I will put that then into the perspective of the disciplinary uh, courts and the disciplinary uh, proceedings. In the recent judgment in Gudmundur Andri Astradson, and this is the judgment from December 2020, the Grand Chamber of the court clarified the scope and the meaning to be given to the concept of the tribunal established by law. And the court reiterated that the purpose of that requirement was to ensure that the judicial organization in a democratic society did not depend on the discretion of the executive, but that it was regulated by law emanating from the parliament. And that the purpose of that requirement is to protect the judiciary against unlawful external and internal influence, in particular from the executive, the legislature, and then internally from within the judiciary itself. In that judgment, for the first time, the court has said that the process of appointing judges necessarily constitutes an inherent element of the concept established by law and that it calls for strict scrutiny and that the court is able to find the violation of Article 6 just and solely on the basis of the fact that the court fi or finding that the the the, the that the court has not been established by, by law. Uh, so, so it established that part of Article 6 as a standalone alone right, and it said that it is not necessary to find the violation to go and to see whether the court at the same time has been 
impartial or has not been impartial or independent. And, and, and this is quite a significant development, especially in the context that we see in Europe uh, these days. However, that doesn't mean that there is not a very close uh, interrelationship in the court's case law between uh, that specific right and the guarantees of independence and impartiality. And while in case uh, uh, Astrazon, the end chamber case Astrazon, the court has decided after finding the violation of the this requirement of the court established by law that there is no need to look whether at the same time the requirement of independence and impartiality has been fulfilled. For example, in the recent Retskovic judgment, the court has said since the violation of the requirement that the court should be established by law and the violate potential potential violation or violation potential violation of the independence and impartiality of the court were actually based on the same circumstances and the same facts then once the court has found the violation of the requirement that the court should be established by law then at the same time, that meant that there is no need to specially look at the impartiality and uh, independence. That meant that the, these two requirements have been violated as well. So you see how the court is uh, playing with, with, uh, with this in two different judgments. Uh, when I was reading your uh, uh, material, one of the things that you have raised, you said, ah, we will have to define who the judge is. We, we have to uh, define, uh, you know, the, the, the notion of the judge and uh, what could be helpful for you. Maybe, you know, when we are talking about whether the tribunal or court established by law, we should first uh, uh, in front of the court define what tribunal or court for us means. And this is autonomous notion for us. So already in 1948 in Schrabeck versus Austria, the court has ruled that the notion of the court should be interpreted in the material sense. Uh, and that uh, its functional ability to resolve matters within its jurisdiction on the basis of the rules of law following the proceedings uh, followed in a certain way. So when we are looking at that, we can maybe suggest that when you are, when you are talking about the judge, you could take into consideration the following. Uh, persons serve a judicial function when they first determine matters within their competence, which are in dispute, on the basis of rules of law and according to proceedings conduct, conducted in a prescribed manner. But this is not sufficient. Uh, they, have, they should have power to make decisions with binding force, which may not be altered by a non-judicial authority. Therefore, advisory opinions uh, would not count per se as such. Uh, and it is uh, interesting, um, yeah, and then, for example, in Xeroflor, a recent judgment against Poland, the issue was raised that the Constitutional Court of Poland is a tribunal because uh, the, uh, the Constitutional Court of Poland could do only abstract review of law and uh, does not uh, look at the specific violations in, in, in specific cases. However, since the abstract review of law gives the opportunity to uh, parties to reopen the proceedings, then, uh, then we have concluded that uh, this is influencing uh, the, uh, the, way, the way in which uh, civil proceedings could be conducted and reopened and so on. And we have that, and then we have said how uh -huh, on this basis the court is the court, the constitutional court is the tribunal. And then the interesting thing that we have said in Astrazon in this respect is that it was also inherent in its in the very notion of tribunal that it should be composed of judges selected on the basis of merit. That is, judges who fulfilled the requirements of technical competence and moral integrity. And the court has noted that the higher the tribunal was placed in the judicial hierarchy, the more demanding the applicable selection criteria should be. So when we are looking at this requirement established by law, the court has developed the three-part test 
a threshold test made up of three criteria that should be taken cumulatively uh, in order to be, so they should be taken cumulatively in order to establish whether a tribunal was established by law. And these uh, criteria actually help the court to uh, balance between the competing principles the principle that the court should be established by law, which is relying on the rule of law and the separation of power. Uh, and on the other hand, the principle of legal certainty and the principle of irremovability of judges. Uh, and these principles, these two last principles, sometimes could come into conflict with the, uh, with the principles I mentioned before that. So, um, uh, so the first criteria and the first uh, question that uh, we are trying to answer in finding whether the court was established according to the law is whether there has been a manifest breach of domestic law. So the starting point is a domestic law and whether in appointing the judges the domestic law has been followed and uh, there should be a manifest breach of that uh, domestic law and it is manifest if it could be uh, objectively and genuinely identifiable and the court has given the examples for example if the specific voting procedure has not been complied with or uh, for example, if uh, it is possible to change the persons who have been nominated only if, uh, if sufficient, uh, sufficient reasoning has been provided and investigation of the background of the can candidates has been undertaken and so on, or, 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 or for example, if there, is the, uh, if there are decisions by the constitutional court how voting uh, should be done uh, and if this is not followed, that all would constitute the fundamental uh, that would be called a manifest breach of, 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 of domestic law. And if the, at the domestic level the breach is found, then the court will just accept that uh, as a face value, it, it won't go into it itself, uh, except if the court uh, thinks that uh, this finding was arbitrary or manifestly unreasonable. And this is exactly what was happening in uh, Astrid's own case. There the court accepted the finding of Iceland courts and found that they were correct. In, for example, Xeroflor versus uh, Poland, where the issue was appointment of judges to the Constitutional Court of Poland, there was nothing at a domestic level, so the court was uh, and had, the court had to look at these issues uh, of the of the domestic law and, uh, and, and compliance with the domestic law itself. And there uh, the court has looked uh, and has concluded that the new same does not have a right to overturn the decision of the old same electing judges after uh, announcement of vacancy. That same during whose mandate the vacancy occurred has rights to elect new judges, that the president has no right to refuse to take an oath of the elected judges and so on, and has concluded that actually the domestic uh, provision were not followed and that the first criteria was satisfied. Uh, Reskovic was, from that perspective, especially interesting case because at a domestic level there were conflicting views and the parties in front of the court uh, uh, relied on these conflicting views. The, 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 the applicant relied on the view of the Supreme Court and the government relied on the view of the Constitutional Court. And then uh, it was a difficult task in front of us actually to justify why we are taking and why we are siding with one or the other views or what kind of view we are taking. And there, I think it's a very interesting reading uh, in, in, in 10 pages, we are explaining why at the end the court has accepted the view of the Supreme Court and not the view of the Constitutional Court and has concluded that there was a breach of the domestic law. Basically, the court found that the way in which the candidates have been proposed uh, and the, uh, the authority by which they were proposed, the National Judicial Council that was appointed uh, uh, primarily by, by, by same and in which uh, judges didn't have any saying almost anymore, 23 of 25 candidates were actually proposed by the legislature and uh, the court 
has concluded that this was one, there were other reasons, but this was one of the main reasons why uh, it, it was considered that uh, the appointment was actually uh, undue influenced by the legislative, by the legislative power, but there were other deficiencies as well. The second criteria that the court is looking at is whether the breach of the domestic law pertains to a fundamental rule of the proceed, procedure for appointing judges. So, so breach of not any rule, you know, would suffice, but it should be the breach of the fundamental rule. And, um, and when, the, when, when the court is looking uh, at that, the court looks whether uh, the rule breach sought to prevent any undue interference by the executive or the legislator with the judiciary or whether the breach in question undermined the very essence of the right to a tribunal established by law. And if that is so, then uh, this second criteria is satisfied. And in reviewing that, the court was, especially in Retzkevich, Retzkovich judgment, was uh, heavily relying on findings of Venice Commission, Greco, OCJ, uh, ECJ, European Commission, so all these international and European bodies, and at the end concluded that the um, fundamental rule was actually violated, uh, and that these rules that I have uh, described beforehand were actually fundamental rules. And then there is the third criteria, whether the allegations regarding the right to a tribunal established by law were effectively reviewed and remedied by the domestic courts, which means that um, the, the, the violations must be subject to judicial review by national courts, but that is not enough. Uh, 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 important is that the violations um, uh, uh, to, to satisfy the requirement of Article 6, important is that the judicial review must be effective, which means that the reviewing court must strike the right balance between preserving the principle of legal certainty and upholding respect for the rule of law. And for example, in Astrid's case, it was concluded that, uh, that, that, that there is a possibility of uh, judicial review, but the judicial review was not done in a correct way. And in Polish cases, it was concluded that there is actually uh, no provisions, that there are actually no provisions at the domestic level that would enable judicial review. So all, uh, so in, in, in Polish cases, all three criteria were satisfied uh, and uh, the violation was found. Violation was found also in Icelandic case. And this is very important because uh, especially the Rescovich case uh, is demonstrating that for us, it is also important for the disciplinary proceedings because in Retskovic, the court has concluded at the end that the disciplinary chamber of the constitutional court that is conducting uh, all disciplinary proceedings against the judiciary, against judges in Poland, is actually not that the tribunal established established by law. And then if we are looking what was the conclusion in Xerox law, that in the meantime became a final judgment because it was not sent to the then chamber at the end. Uh, then, uh, when, 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 when we are arriving to the conclusion of that, then that that opens the door for that the uh, judgments and decisions produced by such uh, by such uh, tribunal that has not been established uh, by law is considered not to be established by law that uh, they uh, these uh, judgments could not produce or may not produce the court didn't take the position yet whether all of these judgments may not produce the effect or in certain circumstances these judgments uh, would not be able to produce effects but it seems the higher the court is there is a great possibility that the judgments will not not be accepted as 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 valid. So 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 this is this, and I, I just wanted, uh, and I don't know how much I didn't look when I started and how much time I might have, but um, and, and, and this last point is very interesting and is actually following the development that started with Ramos Nunez the 
Carvalho versus Portugal, a case uh, that was dealing with disciplinary proceedings in Portugal against the judge, the, the case, the uh, Van Chamber case from 2018, which is significant because it is the case in which was for the first time said that it is not sufficient to give the possibility to, 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 to persons, and in this case judges, uh, just to, to, to come, you know, when, when the administrative body has decided on the discipline, the disciplinary proceedings to give the possibility to come in front of the court. And just the mere fact that you have the ability to come uh, in front of the court that is satisfying all the requirements of the of the of the of the independent and impartial tribunal and, and has uh, and, and is uh, acting according to the requirements of Article Six that that in itself is not sufficient. That actually uh, what has to be done is that uh, not to have a violation of Article Six is that then this review. Uh, has to correct the mistake that has been done uh, in front of the administrative uh, authorities. And in the third requirement of Astrazone, you see that that has, has been picked up. Uh, the other judgment that was related and is interesting uh, and Grain Chamber, and I'm just referring to Grain Chamber judgments, is BACA judgment. And from BACA judgment, you know, you have incorporated in your documents most of the stuff from our, our, our case law. Uh, from, but from BACA judgment, uh, what, what nowadays we consider the most uh, very significant and important is actually concurring opinion by our former president, Judge Sicilianos, where he has um, where he has distinguished the right of persons involved in court proceedings to an independent judge and the judge subjective right to independence. And uh, we have recently communicated the case against Poland where the court will be for the first time addressing this issue of the judge's subjective right to independence. So we will see uh, in which way the case law will develop there. And then uh, the, 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 the other case in front of the Grand Chamber recent case is the Nisofa versus Ukraina. And there, I think what we can take as the most significant development is development within the article. Eight. In this case, the court confirmed that employment-related disputes were not per se excluded from the scope of private life. There were two, but there were two ways in which a private life issues uh, would usually arise in a dispute, and the the, the one is uh, related to the underlying reasons for the impugned measure. For example, if there is discrimination or, or something like that, and this is reason. Uh, based uh, approach, and then in certain cases, uh, you know, we have the case because of the consequences for private life, and this is con consequences based approach. And there, the court has clarified that a certain threshold of severity must be attained, and the applicant has to present evidence substantiating substantiating consequences. And in that case, then after careful review, the court has found that the threshold was not met when the uh, president of the administrative court, Supreme Administrative Court was dismissed. So uh, I will stop here. There were recently other interesting cases, uh, for example, Shoshai versus Albania, which was talking about and which was dealing with the vetting uh, procedure in Albania. Then interesting case, Bilgen versus Turkey, that was dealing with the, the uh, removal of a judge, territorial removal of a judge and uh, no access to court in this respect. And then, uh, as uh, my previous speaker has uh, emphasized, not only judges are relevant there, uh, we also have cases related, for example, to public prosecutors and Kvesi versus Romania in this respect is a significant judgment in front of our court. Thank you very much. Sorry for being maybe too long. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, President Tenkovic, uh, for this very important uh, speech and listening to you. Uh, and of course, uh, we can see from Poland and from my, from my home country how important it is that this case law has been developed uh, of the of the Code of, 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 of Human Rights. Um, we are experiencing now in Poland, of course, this very tough situation with the uh, uh, with the motion of the of the Ministry of Justice to the Polish Constitutional uh, Tribunal, 
uh, asking for declaring Article 6 of the Human Rights Convention as non-constitutional. Uh, so we will have uh, we will have uh, very incredible development uh, to experience. Uh, I hope um, I hope at the end of this uh, of this story will be uh, not so sad as, as as we are at this moment, but. Uh, um, nevertheless, we, we, we see how important this topic is and how important this, uh, this case law, which, which really uh, built up the, 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 uh, the, the ultimate framework and ultimate boundaries for, for the independence of judiciary, for the concept of the court, and for the basic rights of, 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 of citizens. So thank you so much for, for this. Now we have still uh, five minutes uh, left for, for very short discussion. So um, we have this questions and answers form. Please use it if, um, if needed. Uh, and uh, uh, if you have questions to our respective speakers or uh, comments to um, what has been said and, and to, the, to the project itself, to the draft itself. Um, or to the concept of this of this of this draft, um, which we are developing. Um, I think one of the of the uh, uh, oh yes we have just a moment uh, question to justices. Um, it is the question from uh, Shimon Shitrit. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Please make a comment on the issue of old democracies and new democracies. Uh, so the question uh, is very important. Should we have different standards? Uh, so could we tolerate more in old democracies and we have been, should be much more rigid on, 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 on new democracies, which are, yeah, this is exactly the, one of the very important topics. So we would like to, President Tukovic maybe. Uh, you are muted, you are muted. Uh, President Tukovic, you are muted. Fine, and fine now. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. This is the question that pops up uh, very often in discussions about the court's case law, and the uh, court has even been criticized, you know, that sometimes uh, it is uh, more lenient with old democracies than, than, than with the new democracies. I don't know whether the court is more lenient, but that, you know, the, 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 the circumstances, the context, and, 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 and everything might, uh, might be different, although we, we, we see that the violations are occurring in all democracies and, and, and in new democracies, for example, exactly in, in, in the topic about which I was uh, that, that I was speaking about, uh, we had Iceland on the one hand, and then we had Poland, and, and, and the violations were quite similar, we could see in terms of the uh, court established, uh, you know, similar, the, the, the violations were there in terms of the uh, court established by, all, by law and not following the domestic rules in appointing the judges. Uh, what 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 we can see, for example, uh, that uh, uh, in most of the cases, and we cannot say all the cases because you know the exceptions. When 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 the court finds a violation and indicates, you know where the problem is, um, somehow the execution, uh, if the, if the case is going in the heart of the of the legal system and in the heart of the statehood or whatever, then 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 often all the democracies are. Uh, quicker in dealing with the issues than uh, than 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 the, the new democracies and less issues are popping up. Um, whether we should uh, react differently, you know, uh, what, what, what I see, for example, when we find uh, 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 when we find the violations, the, is for example the extent to which we have to explain in judgment the violation, or the extent to which we have to explain what to do about the violation. Uh, of course, it's much less uh, when, when, when we are looking at the old democracies than, than when we are looking at the new democracies, but not to develop different standards, you know, that we are developing the minimum standards and the minimum standards have to be uh, the same for old and, 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 and new democracies. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know whether uh, other speakers would like to comment on, on, on this, I think, very, very important, uh, very important issue. Perhaps I can, I can just add the word. I think we should uh, rather quickly overcome this distinction between uh, old and new democracies. 
you know, the very notion of translation is a notion which is important to understand uh, critically, but then it ends, and then uh, the criteria must be the same, I think. And I think within Europe, there is a discussion, for example, since this is my main field of interest before becoming a judge in labor law, discussion among different labor markets. But there again, we should overcome these distinctions. We should really uh, uh, enforce standards which are the same throughout the European Union. Of course, it's a bit more complicated for the Council of Europe. Uh, standards, but not so different after all. So I fully agree with what has been said by colleagues before. Thank you very much. I have to say, I, I don't like very much this distinction, new and old democracies, because we are already, for instance, as Poland 30 years, and uh, I think there's a situation, uh, this is the problem of, 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 of context and of all factors influencing a given situation and not so much the, whether it's a new or old democracy, uh, even the, of course the tradition play a role. But uh, I think this is the, always the problem of looking on all instruments in the given legal system uh, and uh, which are overseen very often. Okay, we have a, another question um, of, of uh, Mr. McGovern. He says, I don't believe this issue can be exclusively solved within the courts. It is a wider issue of politicization of the judiciary by politicians. How can judges and lawyers effectively change that perspective without becoming, becoming political? Uh, maybe uh, Sophie, you may comment on. Uh, I think it's a, it's a difficult issue. Um, <clears throat> it seems to me that one way of addressing it and one way that many judiciaries have tried to address um, changing perspectives is to so you know talking here in a very general way is to engage more with society be more i think there are different ways of thinking about how judges uh, build their legitimacy and here perhaps it's a question of making sure that judges are being responsive to society and they're responsive to the society to society in their judgments, but they're also making the additional effort to explain their judgments. And perhaps we have seen, I think we have seen in recent years, how many judiciaries have tried to go out there and reach further and try to be understood by society. So I, I mentioned earlier that you need social consensus. And I think judges do need to get out and um, seek social consensus um, in many different ways. Dr. Gutmann, you have written so much about the comparative perspective. Maybe you want to comment this also. Uh, thank you, Frederick, for, for bringing me a question that can be answered in many ways and various perspectives. I would say, in light of the time frame we have, I'm struck, in a sense, because this question raises legitimacy of courts, it raises engagement uh, between the role of the courts and the other, let's say, actors in, in, as you mentioned, Sophie, civil society. The first two things that pop out in my mind is uh, relating to the court of justice in the sense of further engagement in the judgments themselves, whether engagement uh, with the materials, I'm thinking about the rule of law case law, I'm thinking about engagement with the AG opinions, um, ways in which, um, within the tasks that have been conferred on them that the courts, the court or the members of the court can come together uh, and demonstrate what Sophie is saying in terms of really um, making, making it as clear as possible um, that they're carrying out their tasks. Um, I'm also in a sense gonna follow up on Frederick's point about the comparative role and I'm thinking about this through as I'm talking. Um, to me, it's interesting because a lot of discussion has been brought, especially with regard to the Court of Justice in relation to other courts, and I'm thinking here about third states like the United States, uh, in relation to um, these, these matters. Um, and I would say, yeah, we really, in a sense, with judicial independence and with the rule of law, are confronting um, issues that go well beyond um, the role of courts. But I think in this past, let's say, decade of, of, in a sense, trying to, yeah, push the case law further, 
uh, I'm seeing a lot of similar, in a sense, echoes across the Atlantic with regard to um, the importance and the preservation, like never before, for matters that in the past, um, relating to the rule of law, that we never thought about. So I hope, I know this is, in a sense, a general uh, comment. I'll probably think about a fantastic answer once we're finished uh, for now. But, um, but I think really the speaker, and thank you for your question. Um, yes, and I'm also, I, I guess I would conclude by saying, I was struck in the Mount Scopus rules or standards with respect to looking at constitutional culture. Um, how, in a sense, we are obviously confined by law, but in a sense, pushing the boundaries of not only standards in a legal sense, but in a sense, infiltrating and permeating the culture institutionally, constitutionally. And that to me is key. Uh, so just because we may not address it in the same way in a judgment doesn't necessarily mean that it's not of the utmost importance when it comes to rule of law, judicial independence, and all of the various other aspects that are coming through in the case law now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for, for this panel. We are, we are uh, approaching uh, the, the end of it, but uh, I think it was extremely uh, important also for me and for, uh, for, for uh, I hope for, for all our reporters, uh, it will enrich our, our work immensely um, uh, with discussion. Um, I wanted also um, uh, to say that, yeah, Shimon Shitritz made this uh, first comment, but of course we are somehow thanks to, to his uh, initial draft, uh, the, 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 the draft of, of, of the group which has been established by, by Shimon Shitrit. Um, uh, and one word is important here, and it is exactly what, what you, Kathleen, um, uh, is talking about. Uh, the idea of the Monscopus group was the, 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 the somehow developing the culture of judicial independence. And it was the, the, the crucial words, this culture of judicial independence. And it's also the answer that, of course, it is not the matter uh, which should be decided among judges, because uh, this is a matter of, of all society, uh, which must be decided. And it's not the way, it, it, I think one of the, of the advantage of this, what has happened, uh, this, this stress on judicial independence is somehow probably growing awareness, uh, what does it mean for the society as such and, and uh, why it is a value for the society and not a privilege of, of, of a judge, but just a fundamental principle of the organization of the democratic and rule of law based um, uh, society. Uh, thank you so much for uh, for this meeting. Thank you to everybody. Thank you, Sophie, for this presentation of, of, of our principles and this excellent work, which is also doing in um, our group. Uh, thank you for um, uh, Justice uh, Shara, President Bukovic, Dr. Gutmann, for being with us, uh, uh, being in the European Law Institute and, and uh, enriching this discussion uh, for, for future. Thank you to everybody for all participants uh, for, for being with us, uh, listening to it, and, and uh, we are waiting for the further discussion in the in line the process of, of our drafting will develop and, and uh, we are waiting for all your comments. Thank you so much. <laughs>